Good morning everyone. Today I'm going to be reading from Nehemiah chapter 9 verses 33 to 38 and we're going to skip a bit and go to chapter 10 verses 28 to 33. You have been just in all that has come upon us for you have de dealt faithfully and we have acted wickedly. Our kings, our officials, our priests and our ancestors have not kept your law or heeded the commandments and the warnings that you gave them. Even in their own kingdom and in the greater goodness you bestowed on them, and in the large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you, and did not return, and did not turn from their wicked works. Here we are, slaves to this day, slaves in the land that you gave to our ancestors to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They have power also over our bodies and over our livestock at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. Because of this, we make a firm agreement in writing, and on that sealed document are inscribed the names of our officials, our Levites, and our priests. Chapter 10, verse 28. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to adhere to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding, join with their kin, their nobles and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his ordinances and his statutes. We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. And if the peoples of the land bring in the, in the merchandise or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy it from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. And we will forgo the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. We also lay ourselves the ob lay on ourselves the obligation to charge ourselves yearly one third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the rose of bread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed festivals, the sacred donations, and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. All of us have experienced this pandemic differently. Some have lost loved ones. Others have lost jobs. All of us have lost some of our liberty. Some have had no time and some have had too much time. Some have suffered from anxiety or loneliness. But there have also been similarities to our experiences, similarities that reach across borders, across countries, across cultures. And so today I'm going to preach to you a sermon that I first preached in Custodia in northeast Brazil. And I hope that there have been enough similarities in our recent experiences that God will use it to speak to you too. But first I'd like to tell you a little bit about our church and ministry there in North East Brazil. We live in Custodia. It's a small city of about 40,000 people in the interior of North East Brazil in the semi-arid desert region called the Sertão. And there we lead a team from uh, a church in a Brazilian denomination called Betel Brasileiro, which is planting a church in a rural Quilombola community. The city centre church that is planting uh, the church in the Quilombola community, that city centre church uh, is the largest uh, evangelical church uh, in the city uh, of around 150 members. 97% of the population of Custodia are Catholic and the form of Catholicism that's practiced is a folk Catholicism where superstition and worship of saints is rife. It's so different from the Catholicism that, for example, my friends in South Sudan practice that most of the members of our church, uh, the Betel Brasileiro church, would say that Catholics aren't even Christians. The church we're planting in the Kilimbala community is small and informal. We normally meet in a small room uh, in the only communal building in the community, but recently we've been meeting in the open air because of the pandemic. Uh, 
we meet on Saturday afternoons, so the team from the city centre church can go to Sunday services in the city. And on an average Saturday afternoon, we'd have anywhere between five and 20 uh, people from the community, uh, mostly people who were brought up Catholic and are still very influenced in it, who believe in God, but who haven't yet taken the step to surrender their lives to Christ. On a special occasion, Children's Day, Mother's Day, Easter, we might have 40 people. There are three baptised evangelical Christians who are part of our church and another three evangelical Christians who've converted recently, one of whom is struggling with alcoholism uh, and two who have been very influenced by the heresy of prosperity gospel. We try to involve the people from community uh, in services and other activities as much as possible, but there are obviously limits to how much responsibility we can give people before they become Christians or even after in many cases. So for example, even the two most mature and committed Christians uh, are not married to their long-term partners as their partners refuse to marry. So under church rules, they can't be in leadership roles or preach, but we do make sure that we involve them uh, in other ways. The community we're planting the church in, the Kilambala community called Seha Datohi, um, as I say, is a Kilambala community, which means that the ancestors of its residents were mostly African slaves who resisted slavery and formed their own community uh, from 150 to 400 years ago. And in this case, they formed it in the hills about 10 kilometers north of Kustodia. Sehadatohi is like one big family uh, of 120 households all descended from the same small group. Our experience is that it's characterised by family ties, by hard work and by mutual aid. But unfortunately, its members are subject to the racist prejudices that have existed since the times of slavery that have wrongly characterised black people as lazy, as incapable and as immoral. Their geographical isolation means that they've got little access to healthcare or employment and access to education depends on a very unreliable bus service. But land is plentiful and the views are incredible. We're eager to see more people come to Christ in Sehadatohi, but we do know that church planting, especially in Kalambala communities, requires patience. We have been able to build relationships and trust but we've been hampered by the fact that the isolation of the community means we can't always spend as much time there as we would like before having to return to the city. And aside from us, most of the other members of the team from the city centre church haven't been able to build significant relationships yet. That might be one reason why we haven't yet seen a big breakthrough in terms of numbers of people converted and baptised. One way we hope to change that is by building a church building and a house in the community. We'd been praying about this for some time and without mentioning it to them, the community leadership told us that they earmarked a piece of land for us to build both a church building and a house. Now, we're not interested in church buildings for building's sake, but this would give us the opportunity and not just us, other members of the team too, to stay overnight in the community and develop deeper friendships as well as being able to expand the activities that we normally run like music lessons and a mums and tots group, which are limited by the lack of communal space. We're now praying for the resources to start this work when we go back in January. In Sehadatohi, Hannah and I are co-pastors leading a team from the city centre church. We preach to people who are not yet Christians or who are young in faith. So we focus on the person and the works of Christ and our messages are mostly evangelistic or pastoral in nature. In the city centre church in Custodia, the context is very different. There's an established leadership team. There are about 150 members and most are mature Christians. They're knowledgeable on doctrine and upright moral folk, not always so good on ethics, on applying the principles of our faith. The average member is richer and whiter than the residents of Seher Datohi, and while they've got a real missional heart, they sometimes fail to appreciate that 
even though Serha da Torre and other Kilimbala communities are only 10 kilometres away, church planting there is still cross-cultural mission because the context and the cultures are so different from the city. And sometimes they fall into the trap of trying to make the Kilimbala people in Sabah more like them instead of expecting that as people encounter Christ, they will not become more like us, but more like the people that Christ wants them to be and that will learn and be changed in the process too. And in the city centre church, like in many, many evangelical churches in Brazil, there is a danger of political syncretism. What do I mean by that? I mean blindly following and supporting political parties and politicians who talk about family and nation, and even making that support a condition of being a good evangelical without applying biblical principles to the whole of life and the whole of the public sphere. There are other people in the city centre church who have pastoral roles and when I preach and teach there, I see my role as more prophetic, as challenging people to repentance, to a deeper understanding of biblical principles and ethics and to think about what God is doing in his work and how we respond to that. And so at the beginning of the year, we started a series on the Old Testament prophets, thinking about what parts of their message are still relevant to us today. And we especially looked at the prophets who prophesied the exile, that time when after having ignored warning after warning from the prophets, the Israelites were conquered, their temple destroyed, and many were taken away in slavery. We didn't know it at the time, but all the talk about exile, the reasons for exile, what God was doing during the exile and the return from exile, they were to become massively relevant during the pandemic. Because many of us have experienced the isolation of lockdown as a kind of exile. When the Israelites were forced out of their land in the Bible, they became convinced of the truth of the message that the prophets had preached to them. And they repented of sins like idolatry. Without temple, kings or land, they had to learn to practice their religion differently and day-to-day -day spirituality rooted in the scriptures became more important than festivals and rituals. While I don't agree with those who say that God has sent the pandemic as a punishment for sin, I do think that God has used these times to convict us of our sin, to challenge us to go deeper with him and to do things differently, just as he did with the Israelites in exile. So when the pandemic hit Brazil, we looked to see what inspiration we could find from the Old Testament prophets. We remembered the false prophets who said that God wouldn't let the exile happen and warned against automatically believing those who preach messages that we want to hear. Like the idea that the virus isn't real or that the pandemic would end in days or weeks. We warned our church members that we couldn't assume that the pandemic would be short lived, remembering that when Jeremiah preached that God had plans to prosper and not harm the exiles, that didn't mean the exile would be short lived or return imminent, because he also told them that the exile would be 70 years long. The message I'm going to share with you today a shorter version, because I wanted to tell you about our church and context too, is from the book of Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah wasn't a prophet, but the book is from that part of the Old Testament which deals with the exile. It talks about the third phase of return from the exile. The return from exile happened over a period of 90 years. It didn't all happen in one go. The first stage was under Zerubbabel and described in Ezra chapters 1 to 6, the second with the priest Ezra in Ezra chapters 7 to 10, and the third with Nehemiah. And when I preached from this book, it was that time when uh, restrictions were starting to relax in our city. And I pointed out that our return from exile might not happen in one go and it might also take longer than we would like. The book of Nehemiah can be divided in two parts. The first bit, chapters one to seven, deal with the physical reconstruction of the walls of Jerusalem. And that work was completed in 52 days. The second part of the book is perhaps the most important. While the first part deals with the physical reconstruction of the walls, the second part deals with the spiritual reconstruction of the people. 
And this spiritual reconstruction started with the reading of God's word in chapter 8. And through the reading of the word, the people started to understand God's standards and were convinced that they'd failed to meet those standards. And that led to a detailed confession of their sins in chapter 9 and a recommitment to covenant with God in chapter 10, with a new resolve to avoid many of the sins that had led them into exile in the first place. So there was a three-step process that's still relevant today. First, reading the word. Secondly, confessing and repenting of our sins. And third, recommitting to covenantal relationship with God. The part of scripture that Hannah read to us today started with the last bit of their confession and continued with their recommitment to the covenant that God had given them. And so in verses 33 to 37 of chapter 9, their confession is both personal and collective. They acknowledge that together they have done wrong. We've got here political leaders, religious leaders, ordinary folk, people of different generations. Sin is both individual and collective. It's important to confess our individual sins, but also the sins of our society and how we might have participated in them through overt acts, through language which accepts or justifies sin or through failure to act. And they mention their ancestors in verse 34. And that's important because even though we are all responsible for our own sin, we can't excuse ourselves by blaming those who went before us. It's also true that we've learned sinful ways from those who went before us and that sometimes sin becomes so deeply rooted in our society that it's hard to even recognise it as sin. The sin of racism is one of those sins. And I preached this in Custodia uh, not long uh, after George Floyd was killed. But I think it's relevant to the UK too. Giving more importance to white people and to white people's opinions and less to black people and their opinions is usually not deliberate, but subconscious and deeply ingrained. It's something that we learned from our ancestors during the times of slavery. We also apply stereotypes to black people without realising it. So many times I heard members of our church refer to Kilambolas in Sehedatohi as lazy without realising that that stereotype comes from the days of slavery. It certainly doesn't apply to the hard-working folk that I know. Or it could be that a black person doesn't seem like a natural leader to us. And we don't realise that this is because of underlying attitudes and because very deep underneath we don't want to submit to a black person. This kind of sin is a legacy from our ancestors. We need to confess it, repent of it, unlearn it and make amends. I think it's significant that the death of George Floyd happened during lockdown. It wasn't a new thing, it's happened so many times before and since, but I think that God used the moment while we were all locked away in our homes, glued to our screens, to get our attention and make us all engage with the pain and trauma of black communities, hopefully leading to both individual and collective repentance. After confessing their sins, the Israelites recommitted themselves to the covenant that God had made with them, and they made some extra commitments too to avoid repeating the same sins of the past which had become so deeply ingrained in their culture. And so here I'm skipping verses 1 to 27 of chapter 10, which is basically a list of names of people who signed the agreement that they made, and jumping uh, to verses 28 to 31 of chapter 10. And here we've got three commitments. In verse 30, not to marry with the neighbouring peoples. In verse 31, to obey the spirit of the law and not only the letter of the law in relation to the Sabbath. And in verses 32 and 33 and continuing, to increase the offering to the temple so that religion was 
not corrupted by depending on finance from corrupt political leaders. So let's look at each commitment in turn and why it was important. The promise not to marry from the neighbouring nations, in verse 30, was made to avoid idolatry, the sin most criticised by the Old Testament prophets and the biggest reason given by the prophets for the exile. The Israelites had already confessed that sin in chapter 9, verses 18 and 26. Now, it's important to say that marrying a foreigner wasn't totally forbidden in the Old Testament. In fact, many heroes of faith did just that. So Joseph, Moses, David, all married foreigners. Marriage with foreigners who converted to worship the true God was allowed. Many of Jesus' ancestors were foreigners, for example, Rahab and Ruth. But marrying a woman who hadn't converted and who continued to worship other gods was very dangerous. So... 1 Kings 11 verses 1 to 8 says that Solomon loved many foreign women and that they led him away from God and to worship other gods, even making altars to them. So this promise was made to avoid repeating the sins of the past, to avoid repeating Solomon's sin, to avoid returning to the sin of idolatry which had led them into exile. In the New Testament, this is even clearer. 1 Peter uh, 2 verse 9 says God calls people of all nations to be a new nation that belongs to him. So there's no restriction of ma on marrying people from different earthly nations. But we should be careful about the relationships we have with people who don't share our faith in Christ, especially when it comes to romantic relationships. Of course, it's different if we were already married before coming to know Christ. But we shouldn't enter into a relationship with someone who doesn't have the same faith, who doesn't share the thing that's most important in our lives. We shouldn't think that that person will definitely convert because of us. It doesn't always happen. It didn't happen with the wives of Solomon. And if that great king with all his wisdom was led away from God by being married to non-believers, do we think that we're immune? The second commitment is related to the Sabbath. Now, God had given a day of rest to his people, a day to be totally dedicated to God on which they shouldn't do work. But it wasn't just a day, but also a principle. Leviticus chapter 25 says that the land should have a rest every seven years. So God put in place rules to avoid the exploitation of the land and to let it be replenished regularly. Deuteronomy 7 talks about debts being forgiven every seven years. And later in Leviticus 25, the principle of the day of Jubilee is elaborated. So every seven times seven years, every 40, 50 years, the land would be redistributed so that every family would have a piece of land to live in and to cultivate. And that way, equality could never grow too big. And every family had the possibility of work and of providing for themselves. So the Sabbath was a day, yes, but also a principle. The intention was for the Sabbath to liberate people, to be a blessing to everyone. And Jesus later criticised those who turned the Sabbath from liberating blessing into a burden. But the Israelites tried to find ways around those laws by obeying the letter, but not the spirit of the law. Now, they couldn't work or buy or sell from or to other Israelites. So what did they do to allow business to continue on the Sabbath to avoid losing potential profit? They sold or bought from foreigners or even sent their foreign slaves to do work on the Sabbath for them. And some laws like the forgiveness of debts were considered simply metaphorical and not obeyed. So here in verse 31, the principle of the Sabbath was restored. The Israelites committed themselves to not find a way around the law, to respect the day of the Lord and not insist their employees do work on it. And they committed to obey even the difficult bits of scripture, to forgive debts and to let the land rest every seven years. We will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. How do you treat the day of the Lord? 
Sunday for us. Do you go to church, but then the rest of the day is just like any other day? Have you got employees? Do you give a day of rest to them, whether it's Sunday or another day? Or do you find a way around it like the Israelites did? This text is challenging for a world which idolises work, in which we have a 24-7 economy. It's challenging for a world that treats the Earth's resources as if they were our own and not God's. It's challenging for economies based on debt and the recuperation of debts. The third commitment from verse 32 onwards turned the occasional tax of Exodus 30 verses 11 to 16 into an annual temple tax. For centuries, sporadic offerings hadn't provided enough for the running of the temple and so the temple relied on the financial support of kings. The priests and the prophets linked to the temple had fear of criticising the government of the day even when they did things against God's law because they might lose their salaries. The governments loved the credibility that they had by being seen to be supported by religious leaders or engaging in religious activities. And once the King Ahaz, he even offered sacrifices in the temple, which, as he wasn't a priest, was against the law. To me, this shows us the importance of the separation of church and state. It's exactly because faith has so much to say about politics that there has to be a separation between church and state. There's no candidate or party that hasn't erred from the word of God, and we have to maintain the liberty to criticise them where this is the case. We maintain this separation by whatever our personal views, and it's totally legitimate for individual members of churches to have political views, I certainly do, but we maintain that separation by whatever our personal views, not supporting candidates or parties from the pulpit, not using colours or symbols linked to candidates inside the church and above all by not accepting financial help as a church from parties or candidates. To make this possible, members have got to sustain the work of the church. And in these verses, the Israelites committed to doing exactly that. To bring the best part of their first fruits, not what was left over after they bought the things they wanted for themselves, as an offering on a regular basis. In Brazil, a law has just been passed by those who want the political support of evangelicals, writing off debt owed by the government by evangelical churches who wrongly didn't pay taxes legally owed. What message does that send to the rest of society? What does that say to non-believers about who we follow? So what can we learn from the three commitments? Firstly, if there's any risk of idolatry, it's better to restrict our own liberty than run the risk of worshipping an idol. Remember, idolatry isn't only worshipping statues, but can be anything we put in God's place, riches, nation, work, our football team, or even family. Sometimes something that's good can still be idolatry if we put it in God's place. Second, we should apply the liberating principle of Sabbath and try not to find ways around it. Forgiving debts, respecting God's creation, not exploiting workers and re-evaluating our own lives to make sure we put God, family and work in the right order. The pandemic made us stop. Let's not rush to get back to how things were, but reevaluate our work life balance to make sure that we have enough rest, enough time for our families, and enough time principally for God in our day to day lives. Thirdly, we should give first to God and give enough so that the work of our local church doesn't depend on others, and we're free to criticise the authorities when they go against biblical commitments. Biblical commandments, sorry. But beyond all, we should learn from the process that the Israelites went through. We shouldn't rush to return to how things were done before the crisis. We should take more time to read God's word. Through that, to identify the sins of our society, whether they're similar to or different to the sins of the Israelites. 
individual sins, collective, even historic sins, and make specific commitments to do things differently. <laughs>